I'm telling you. Look at the person beside you and say, today's going to be a good day. Tell them, say, it's going to be a good day. You're going to be a good, good day. Man, it is so good to see you guys. Welcome to be out in the house of the Lord. And I uh, just also just want to welcome everyone's watching online as well. And, you know, back in Christmas, we took up our year-end offering. And part of that year-end offering was to take the Word of God, not only in this house, but to get it out uh, through a live broadcast. And because of your generosity, we've been able to do that. And there's people literally, and it blows my mind, all over the world that logs into watching what's going on right here in Moore, Kentucky. And there's a family just near and dear to my heart this morning that their little boy in Cincinnati Children's Home has a tumor in the back of their, the back of his brain. And uh, they're having surgery this morning right now. And because of your generosity, the family is able to be with us right now, online watching what God is doing in the midst while their son is in surgery. So come on, can we just thank Jesus for what he is doing in the house? Come on, guys, let's pray together. God, we expect great things today from you. God, we believe that you're in this place. We sense your nearness. We sense your presence. And God, we're not here by mistake. We're not here by accident. Every single person here is for a reason. So God, for the next moments, I pray you just clear our hearts, you clear our minds, that all that we can focus on is you. Because Father, if we will encounter Jesus this morning, we will not leave this place the same. That's the reason why we sing. It's the reason why we're here. It's the reason why we're alive. It's the reason why we have breath. And that is to praise you. So Father, inhabit the praises of your people. Holy Spirit, move in this place like you've never moved before. And we'll never fail to give you all the glory and for all the praise. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, come on out. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Go ahead and high five someone beside you. Say, I'm glad you're here today. Go ahead and say, I'm glad you're here today. Glad you're here today. Well, well, well. The rowdy bunch. You guys slept in this morning. Come on. Yes, you better pray. I hope and get out of here by 1 p.m. for you go watch the Wildcats play. You know what I'm saying? That's why, that's, what? That's the reason why, <laughs> that's the reason why the people in the first service, man, they didn't trust me I'd get done on time. But if you pray fast enough, we might be able to get out here just in time for you to go and eat something good and hang out with your friends and your family. Hey, we're in a series called What on Earth Am I Here For? You know, it's the number one Google search. Uh, you search Google, what's my purpose? In fact, Google will say the number one search is why am I here? What's my purpose in life? And six weeks ago, we kicked off this series talking about what's your purpose? You know, everybody got, has a purpose. God doesn't make anything junk. God doesn't make anything by mistake. You are here for a reason, and we're looking for that reason. God, what is your purpose for me? You know, you may have been told your whole life you're an accident. Your parents may have said we had you by accident, but there's no such thing as an accident person. God planned you, formed you, called you, anointed you to do exactly what he's called you to do, and he will make sure it comes to pass in your life. So if you're here and you feel like a mistake, if you're here and you feel like an accident, I got some good news for you. Don't you believe the devil? He's a liar. He has a purpose, and God has a purpose for your life. And so he created you by him, for him, him for a specific reason, and I promise you it's bigger than your paycheck and it's bigger than your career. Your career, yes, may be linked with your calling, but your calling is bigger than your career. So what is the career, what is the calling, I mean, that God has for your life? And the first week we looked at that one of the callings is a call to be loved. Do you know that God created the whole universe because he loves you? <laughs> he created it just for you. God didn't create you to do something for him. God created you to receive something from him, and that is his love. And until you get that, until you let that wrap around your mind that he loves you that much, nothing else on the planet is going to make sense to you. Nothing else can make sense until you wrap yourself. He loves me so much that he created me, that he sent his son to die for me. That's how much he loves you. You are not here by accident. God has a purpose for you. God wants to love you. But not only that, God don't just called you to love you, but he also called you to be part of the family. It's called to belong. God wants you to belong to the family of God. And so we talked about that. How do we come into the family of God? How do we come into the big C, the church? How does that happen? Right, the Bible says we're adopted into his family. How do we get the adoption? Where's the adoption papers, right? How, how does that work? How do you pay for something like that? Well, God says, here's how you get into my family. I'm gonna send my son, Jesus. He's gonna get up, he's gonna die on the cross and get up out of the grave. And if you put your faith in my son, you can be adopted into the family. In fact, I will write your name in the family book. I will write your name in the book of life. You will be in the family for all eternity if you'll put your faith and trust in my son, Jesus. You were created to belong to the family. The third week we talked about you were called to become. 
See, when you're placed in the family of God, when you give your life to Jesus, you become like spiritual babies, right? God throws a birthday party for you. Ah, it's awesome. It's great. But you're still just an infant in Christ. He wants you to mature. He wants you to become like who? Like Jesus. God wants you to become like Jesus. And we, we gave some practical advice. How do I do that, right? How do I become like Jesus? Now, you're not going to become a God, but God wants you to become godly. So how do I do that? Well, we looked at that. How do I, how do I become like Jesus? Well, here's the reality. Just a quick cliff notes to that week if you missed it. If you want to become like Jesus, you need to hang out with Jesus. And the most of us, we just don't spend time hanging out with Jesus. But the more and more you spend time hanging out with Jesus in the Word and praying and things like that, the more you're going to become like him. And then last week we talked about the call to be blessed. That God has called you to be a blessing to other people. God did not call you to live a selfish life where it's all about you. God formed you and called you and drawed you and saved you so that you would serve him by serving other people. You have been saved to serve God. And last week I said, if you remember, every one of us are ministers. Everyone, now not everyone is going to be a pastor, but every one of us are ministers. Why? Because minister is just a servant. And God has called all of us to serve. That's the reason why we're doing Hope Week this week. It's not too late to jump in. Sign up to be. Maybe you can give 30 minutes of your time. Maybe you can give an hour of your time. Maybe you can give a block of your time. It doesn't matter. Where can I just find a place to serve my community and make a difference? And I was thinking about this. Every one of you guys are watching online from all different cities all over this region. And maybe for you, you should do Hope Week. Like, for instance, find a place this week and say, I got an extra hour of my time. Where can I donate my time to serve a place? You don't have to be just in Moorhead to do that. You can be in Grayson. You can be in Maysville. You can be in Pikeville. Where people are watching. You can be in Mount Sterling. It doesn't matter. Just say, you know what? I want to be part of what God's doing there, and I want to be part of Hope Week in my city. I want to bring hope. Why? Because the local church is the hope of the world, and we represent Jesus. So let's go show a hopeless region hope that Jesus loves them and that he cares about them, and that's the reason why, because he's called us to serve. And so when we look at today, it's the fifth one. We'll, we'll finish it next week after Hope Week. But as we look at the last one today, I want to challenge you with the talk. The first one was, I'm called to belong. I'm called to be loved. I'm called to become like Jesus. I'm called to bless other people and to serve them. And then today, here's the last one. It's one of my favorite ones, is that I'm called to be sent. That God has called me to send me into the world. He saved me from the world, but he didn't take me out of the world. See, most people think God saves you so you can go to heaven. If the only reason why God saved you was to take you to heaven, then the moment you got saved, you should have went on to heaven. But God left you in the world. Why? Why does he leave you here in the world? It's because he's sending you into the world so you can preach the good news, so you can share the good news, so you can help people come to know his son, Jesus, just like you did. Here's God's plan for all of history. He's gathering a family who's going to love him and live with him for all eternity. And you guess what? This is going to blow you away. And God wants to use you to be part of it. Look at the person sitting beside say, God's going to use you. Tell him, say, God's going to use you. Look back with the other person with the attitude, say, no, God's going to use you. He's going to use you, right? And one of the passages that I love, that there's so many passages that I could preach this from, but this is one of my favorite ones. I just want to really, I feel like God's really pressed this on my heart. I want to share with you today. It's found in John chapter 4. So get your Bibles. Go with me to John chapter 4. I'm in the New Living Translation in case you're using your Bible app and wanting to follow along with me. And John chapter 4, I believe that this passage right here is going to help us learn some things that we could do when it comes to being sent by God to, to change a city, to change a region, to whatever it may be for you, to change your family tree, to change your family, to change your workplace, maybe to change your school. Because I believe that God can do that in your life. And here's what's going to have to happen. The urgency of the gospel is going to have to come back. At, my, at your pastor's heart is an evangelist. I want to see people saved more than anything else. I mean, I want to see people come to know Christ. I know what it's like to be lost and then to be found. I know what it's like to be blind and now to see. And it's, I want everyone on the planet to experience the freedom that I have. The freedom and the forgiveness of my sin. Are you kidding me? Yes, all your sins. Even the ones you do in middle school and high school. Can I get a witness? You know what I'm saying? God forgives them. And I want everyone to experience that. And I want everyone in your family to experience that as well. And I believe that this passage is going to help us understand that and see the urgency of the gospel. So if you're ready to get started, I said, let's go. All right, here we go. You said it. 
You better be praying. We're going to get out of here on time. Now, this passage is fascinating. I'm going to really kind of story the first part of it, and then we're going to pick it up here in verse 20 so I mean, just in a minute. And so Jesus' disciples are baptizing people left and right. I mean, people are getting saved. John the Baptist has told his disciples to go follow Jesus. The Pharisees can't stand it because Jesus' disciples are baptizing more than John the Baptist's disciples. He's like, they're like, what in the world is going on with our religious system here? People are getting saved. People are getting baptized. And then the Bible says that Jesus left Judea and he was going to Galilee. But on his way to Galilee, he had to go through Samaria. Now, I wish I had a map. I can show you this on, on, on a map if I had it in front of me. But the reality is Jesus didn't have to go through Samaria. And the truth is no Jews go to Samaria. I mean, Jews always went around Samaria. They never went to Samaria because Samaritans and the Jews hated each other. I mean, hate with a capital H. I mean, they couldn't stand each other. And the reason why the Jews hated the Samaritans so much is because the reality is they were half-breeds. And what I mean by that, they, they intermarried in between Gentiles and Jews, and they mixed up, you know, their, their ancestors, and they really couldn't trace their ancestors back. In fact, they get on Ancestor.com, and it says, sorry, we can't trace back. You know how far we're going here. Well, the Jews like, listen, you don't even know who your ancestors are. We're from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We're true blood. You're half blood. In fact, you're mud blood. You know what I'm saying? I know some of y'all got that. You know what I'm saying? All right. You got mud blood in you. You're, you're mixed, mixed generation. And therefore, you cannot be pure as the Jews. So go do your thing. In fact, Samaritans were looked down as the lowest of the lowest class. There were two fighting words when it came to a Jew. You talk about my mama and you call me the S word, Samaritan. What y'all think I was talking about, right? The S word. I'm a Samaritan, that's fighting words for me. And they could not stand Samaritans. But Jesus, being God, said, I have to go to Samaria. And I could understand the disciples going, no, you don't, man. Nobody goes to Samaria. But Jesus like, we're gonna go because I have something that I want to accomplish. So here's Jesus, and they make it to Samaria, and they come to Jacob's well. Now, Jacob's well is a very old well, and this is where tons of people come out from the city of Samaria. They would get water, and they would feed their animals. They, they feed themselves. I mean, it's, just, it's a great place for them to go. But however, it's noon, the Bible tells us. So here it's high noon, middle of the desert. It's hot. You know what I'm saying? It's hot, and Jesus is tired. Why is he tired? Because he's 100% man. He's man wrapped up in God and God and man and, and the flesh and the crazy, but he's tired. And he sits down by the well and the disciple says, okay, listen, let's go get Jesus something to eat. Maybe he's hungry, maybe he's not. And so Jesus leans up and get the well and the disciples go into the city of Samaria. So here it is, Jesus just chilling, leaning against the well, probably dozed off a little bit. And next thing you know, here comes a lady. And so a lady is walking up to the well and she gets to the well and next she noticed Jesus sitting there. Jesus looks up at this woman and says, could you give me something to drink? And she just about loses her mind. See, you got to put yourself in the story. She's like, what are you doing talking to me? You're a man. I'm a woman. You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. We don't hang out, bro. We don't talk to each other. Who are you to talk to me? You see, back then, even Jewish men would hardly, and most of them would not talk to even their wives out in public. They just didn't talk that way. They kept it together. You never seen a man in public talking to a woman. And now here's Jesus, a rabbi, talking to a woman who's a Samaritan. She's like, I can't believe you did this. I can't believe you would even talk to me. So Jesus looks at her and he says, like, listen, girl, listen, 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 listen. If you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me for a drink of water and I would get you something to drink. And then I could see her hand going like this and her hair snap back. I don't know why. That's how my mind looks like whenever she begins to talk. She's like, oh, no, you did. You think you're going to give me some water? This is what the Bible says. You don't even have a bucket. You don't even have a rope. And is your water better than Jacob's water? Come on, man, really? This well has been feeding our families for a generation and you've got something that's greater than Jacob's water? I don't believe this. Then Jesus looks at her and he says, girl, listen. If you take some of the water that I give you, you will never thirst again, and you will never be thirsty. It's like this fresh water will bubble up within you, and you'll have this eternal life, and you'll never have to come back to, and, and get this kind of water again. I can give you living water. And she goes, could you give me some? Where do you get this? I want it now. Why do you think she was so passionate about giving some of this living water? Well, let's just get the backstory to this woman. What we'll find out here just in a moment, that this woman's an outcast. In her society, she has a past. She has a reputation. And everyone has now shunned this woman. Why? How do we know that? Number one, you don't go to the well in the middle of the day. Who goes to a well in a desert at noon? 
And what woman ever would travel by herself? You don't do that. It's too dangerous. All, everyone knows the custom. All the women get up at 6 o'clock in the morning. They go to the Jacob's well. They fill up all their jugs, and then they take it back to the city before it gets too hot. Why is she not traveling with the other women? Let me tell you why. It's because they turned their backs on her. They talk about her. They've shunned her. They've made fun of her. And now she comes out by herself because of her past, because of her reputation. Because every time they would see her, they would go, oh, there she is again. We heard about her, right? We read about her on Facebook, you know? I mean, they talk about all this stuff, right? And so here she is by herself because she's lonely, because she's been hurt, because she has a past, and because there's a circumstance and situations in her life. She's been outcast to her society. She's been shoved away by the other women in the community. And now she's out here meeting this guy who's a Jew who's talking to her about some water. If you give me that water, I don't ever have to come back to the well. And I'm, I'm tired of coming out here. It's hot. It's at noon. And people make fun of me. Give me some of that water so I never have to come back to the well. Well, obviously, Jesus wasn't talking about physical water. He's talking about spiritual water that I can do with it. She didn't get it. So Jesus says, let's get to the point. She's, Jesus looks at this woman and says, listen, do me a favor. She's like, what? He said, go get your husband. Excuse me? Go get your husband. Let's go get your husband. Let's talk about this. She looks at me and she goes, I don't have a husband. You know, I can say, that's, that's how my mind looks at it. I don't know why. Just when I read the Bible, it just comes out like that. She goes, I don't have a husband. Jesus says, you're right, you don't have a husband. In fact, you've been married five times and the guy you're shacking up with right now is not your husband. She's like, oh no, you didn't. You've been reading that on topics. They've been writing all kinds of stuff about me on topics, right? I mean, I mean, that's just how my mind works. You've been reading about me. And she goes, well, I must perceive you must be a prophet because how in the world are you gonna know that I've been married five times and the guy I'm living with right now is not my husband? How are you gonna know that? Who's been talking about me? You must be a prophet. And then she gets all theological. She gets in this theological debate. She knows a little bit about her Bible. She looks up and says, you Jews, you think you guys got it figured out, right? You go down there and you worship in your temple. You think only God dwells down in that place. Down there. But we Samaritans, we worship up here on this mountain. And as we worship here, God does great things here. But listen to me. You, you think you know it all. And Jesus like, listen, girl, listen, listen, listen. We Jews, we understand salvation comes from the Jews. But listen, there's going to come a day and there's going to come a time when you can worship in Jerusalem, you can worship in Samaria, you can worship in, in Moorhead, you can worship in Grayson, you can worship in Mount Sterling. There's going to come a time that it doesn't matter where you worship as long as you worship with spirit and in truth. And then she says this. Well, when the Messiah comes, she was waiting for Jesus. When the anointed one comes, she's been taught, even though she's half blood, mud blood, mixed blood, and all this stuff over here, even though she's been outcast from Jerusalem where the temple is, someone has still been teaching her that there will be a day that the anointed one would come and deliver them. And she makes a statement. She says, someday when the Messiah comes, he will fix all this and he will straighten this out. And then we pick up in verse 26. Jesus looks at this girl and look what he says. I am the Messiah. I wish I was there. Wouldn't that have been crazy just to be there, just to see this, like the, her eyes, like, oh, snap. You know, like, oh, my goodness, what in the world is going on? I am the Messiah. So now picture this. Jesus at the well, hot, sun, sweat, woman, we're sitting here, it's all over the place. Here comes the, the, the disciples. Now, in my mind, I feel like they're eating before they get to Jesus because they're hungry, right? They're eating in the bag, they're pouring out some bread, and like they're talking like, I, I, don't, I wish I would have bought this, I wish I'd have got that Snicker bar, I don't know what they're talking about. And next thing you know, they get there, and they got their bag of groceries, and they got their food, and they see Jesus talking to a woman, and then they drop their food, like, what is he doing? Look what happens here in verse 27. Just then the disciples came back, just then, when he was talking to the woman. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Why are you talking to a woman? Why are you with her? None of them had the audacity to ask that. And then verse 28, the woman left her water jar beside the well and she ran. I mean, she like called Uber and just got out of Dodge. I mean, she ran all the way to the village telling every single one. Now, I think this is fascinating. What she went looking for or what she went wanting was this physical water. It's amazing she leaves her jar behind. It's like that didn't matter to her no more. In fact, she runs all the way back in town and she preaches her first sermon. 
I mean, this is crazy. She goes into the city that has shunned her, and they will have nothing to do with her, and she preaches her first sermon. This is amazing. I mean, this will blow you away. In fact, that's my goal for the day, is to turn every single one of you into an evangelist for the gospel. You see, you're evangelists about something. Every one of you are, right? You all are evangelists. Some of you are evangelists about iPhones. It can't be Samsung. It's got to be an iPhone. You know what I'm saying? I can't have a Samsung. And you're like an evangelist for, for iPhone. Some of you, it's the brand of your vehicle. It's Chevy. I'll never drive a stinking Ford in my life. It's a che- I'm a Chevy man. My grandpa was a Chevy man. My dad's a Chevy man. I'm a che- Chevy runs deep in my family. Chevy all the way. <laughs> Jesus saves. Y'all don't say a word. Chevy's a truck. Hey, man, break on. Break on. Oh, my goodness, right? You're all evangelists about something. Some of you, maybe it's your, I mean, listen, it's amazing. And I can't speak for every single one of you, but so many people are like evangelists for their politics, right? They're so passionate about a party, and you're so passionate about a, a statement, but you have no passion for Jesus. Something's wrong there, right? We're all evangelists about something. And what I mean by evangelists, you're trying to get somebody to persuade them to be part of your team, to come to your tribe, to believe in your party, whatever. We all are evangelists about something, but we got to be an evangelist when it comes to the gospel. And I'm going to give you a sermon today. You're going to blow this away. I'm going to give you a sermon today that every single one of you can preach. I'm going to turn everyone into preachers today. Every one of you, listen, I'm going to give you a sermon. I'm going to give you a title to your sermon that every one of you can preach. You can preach to your classmates. You can preach to your coach. You can preach to your family. You can preach at work. You can preach to your sorority sisters, to your fraternity brother. It doesn't matter. I'm going to give you a sermon today that every single one of you can preach. And we find it right here in this text. And I I think this is going to challenge you. Look what happens in verse 29. She runs back to the city and look what she says. Come and see a man who told me everything I've ever did. Now, now, again, I like to get into the story. I like to put myself in the story run and read the Bible. And could you imagine this? She comes running into town and she's breathing. You ain't gonna believe this. Excuse me. You gotta come see this. I met a man who told me everything I've ever did. And I can hear people in the marketplace going, honey, everybody knows what she's been doing. Everybody knows what I want to say, right? Everybody already knows. Why? Because she's an outcast. Everybody knows her story. That's how I see this. But she goes, you gotta see this. Could this man be the Messiah? And then all of a sudden, everybody perked up. Could he be the Messiah? And listen, this is the title of your sermon. This is the sermon that every single one of you can preach and every single one of you should preach. And that's this, come and see. Come and see. Come and see. Come and see. Come on, you gotta come and see. You gotta come and see. Now, let me help you put some context to your sermon. I'm not telling you to go preach and say, come and see a building. Hey, you gotta come and see a building. We got this new building, it's awesome. And I'm thankful, God, you're providing this place for us. It's a great house to worship in. I'm not even saying, come and see our kids' ministry. We got an unbelievable kids' ministry, y'all. You gotta come and see this kids' ministry. It's crazy. They put stickers on the back of your kids. They give you a lollipop. I mean, crazy. We got, like, we got, I mean, it's gonna be crazy. We got, like, this hot air balloon and eggs gonna fall and Easter bunny go, ah! I mean, this is crazy. You got, that's awesome stuff. We got an amazing, dynamic youth ministry. There is no one in the region that puts on a level of, of a service for youth than we do right here, hands down, unbelievable youth ministry. And that's awesome, right? I'm not even say, come and see. I'm not saying, you gotta come to see on Sunday morning. We got a worship team, it's just crazy. You got this guy, he's got blonde hair, it sticks up to here, homeboy can preach, he can sing. I mean, it's just amazing. He's got swag like, I mean, that stuff's good. But that's not what I'm telling you to come and see. Your sermon is not come and see the amenities. Your sermon should be, come and see how he's changed me. Come and see how he's changed my marriage, my finances, my emotions, my addiction. Come and see what he's done in me. Listen, I was once blind, but now I can see. I was once lost, but now I'm found. Come and see. And see, I got, I got, I believe there's reasons why we kind of just go to the amenities. And I think that's great. We got a great facility, great kids, great youth. That's great to get people in the door. But the reality is this. When they look at you and they say, come and see how he's changed me. Now you've got my attention. She runs back and she preaches the message. Come and see someone who told me everything about me. Could he be the Messiah? 
Now, every time I talk about something like that, here's the pushback I get because the devil's right here today and he's gonna do everything he can to lie to you. And he's gonna say, oh, but not you. <laughs> and that might be good for them to go preach the gospel. That might be good for them to go talk to their roommates and stuff, but not you. But not you. And here's the reality. We make excuses for not preaching a message, come and see, which all of us, by the way, have been commanded to do. If you're a believer in Christ Jesus, if you put your faith in Christ, if you've been adopted to the family, God has called you to send you. You can't say, well, that's what the preacher over there is for. That's what, no, that's what you're for. It's to go and share the good news about Jesus and how he can change your life. Come and see. But here's the reality. Most of us make excuses. And I'm gonna give you really quickly the two top excuses that you're gonna make that the devil's gonna lie to you and that most people believe. If you wanna write this down, I want you to write this down. Here's the first one and this one. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough to invite someone to come and see. Because here's the reality, Pastor, I'm not really living the life I should be living. If I tell my people at work, come and see, they know me. They know I get wasted on the weekend. I can't go say, come and see. If I go to my high school friends and I go to them and say, hey, you should come with me to youth, or you should come with me you know, to, to church, you should come and see what God's doing. They know I'm still having sex with my boyfriend and my girlfriend. They know everything about me. You ask me to come, come and see. I can't go to work and tell people to come to see. You know how hard-nosed boss I am? And I yell at people and I say things I shouldn't say. I don't feel like I'm good enough to go to someone and say, come and see, when I'm not even living the life I should be living. Well, let's fix that. Start living the life you should be living. Right? Let's fix that. But the reality is, listen, she's like, think about this woman right here. Is she good enough? Was she good enough? When the society said you've been married five times, you've been shacking up with the man in the sixth one right now, are you good enough? See, he debunks this. See, at the end of the Gospel of John, here's what John writes. John writes, I can write so many stories about Jesus, it would fill all the books in the world. There's stories upon stories upon stories. Then why does John pick this one? If he can write about any story about Jesus, why does he pick this one? I pur purposely believe that the Holy Spirit told John to put this one in there so that people like me and you could come and say, listen, if she can do it, I can do it. If God can use her, God can use me. Come and see, I'm not good enough. That is a lie from the enemy. Pastor, you don't know my past. You don't know what I've said. You don't know what I tried. And the reality is this is crazy, this is crazy. You don't have to be perfect to talk about a perfect Jesus. You don't have to be. In fact, the reality is if you look at this story, the more jacked up you are, the better position you are for God to use you. Welcome to Better Life Church. Because <laughs> if you're perfect and you're here, you better watch out, we'll mess you up. But God takes a mess like you and a mess like me and turns it into a message for the world. I'm not good enough. No, no, no. You can't have that excuse no more. She's not good enough, but God used her. Here's the second excuse, I don't know enough. I don't know enough, man. I mean, I don't know enough about the Bible. Well, I mean, well, what if I'm at work and somebody says, did, did, did Adam have a belly button? And I don't know. What if I get at work and they start talking about creation and science and they say, do you believe in seven day creation or 7,000 year creation? Do you believe in, in the dinosaurs? Where did the dinosaurs go? Listen, you don't have to explain the Trinity or the beast in the book of Revelation, to be able to say, come and see how Jesus changed my life. And let me help you right now, let me help you right now. When someone asks you a question that you don't know about the Bible, oh my gosh, you ready for this? This is so profound, it's gonna, you're gonna fall over when I tell you this, because this is what you say when somebody in your family or somebody at work asks you a question that you don't know about the Bible, here's what you say to them. You look back at them like this, I don't know. <laughs> really? See, I think that's one of the law of the enemies. You've got to know everything there is before you can share. And you know really where that's rooted in? Pride. You know how many people I counsel and they'll ask me questions and I look right at them and I was like, I don't know. There's things I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why God does that way. I don't know why it happened that way. I don't know what God's up to. I, I don't know. It's okay to tell people you don't know. But don't let that be an excuse that I'm not good enough and I don't know enough to be able to say, come and see what he's done in my life, how he's fixed my life, how he's fixed me emotionally, how he's broke my bondage, how he's broke my addiction, how he's fixed my marriage, how he's brought my kid home. You don't have to be perfect or know enough to do that. 
And I love her approach. She just didn't go and invite them. Hey, you should come to church sometime with me. And we do that, I think, sometimes because we're scared just to force people, like we're forcing people. I hear it all the time for parents. Well, you know, my kid's now 13. They're a teenager, and I just, I want them to choose on their own, and I can't make them go to church. I want to make them go to church. They're your kid. What do you mean? Well, I just don't want to force my kids to church, and I just want to force people to church because I just want to, you know, push them away. Where are you going to scare them to? Hell number two? I mean, what? I'll be like, boy, don't you talk, you talk to me like that, boy. You go to church, you know what I'm saying? They're your kid. It's the best place you can be in the presence of the Lord. Her approach wasn't, hey, you should just come. Her approach was, come and see. No, you're coming right now. You're gonna come right now. And look what happens in verse 30. So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Listen. They, they came running. What was different? Why did they listen to her? Why did they listen to her? Here's the outcast, a woman. Why did they listen to her? Because they saw something different in her. They knew she, something's changed. Something's changed about her. And they listened and they went running out to Jesus to see Jesus. Now picture this. Come on, picture this. They're at the well. Disciples are eating their snacks. No one asked Jesus is about this situation. They asked Jesus, are you hungry? He's like, man, listen, I am so full on the word right now. I got bread you don't even know what to talk about, man. God is up to something great. God's doing some good stuff. I'm not, I don't even have time to eat. And I can see Jesus standing up dusting himself off from the sand that's been blowing around. And he's like, guys, come here, come here, come here, come here, guys, come here. Look, 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 come here, get up, get up, get up, Peter, come on, get up, get over here. Look. And what he's looking at is the people walking from Samaria by streams to the well. And as he says, look, guys, look, 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 look at this. This is crazy. This is unbelievable. He's seeing all the people walk towards him. And then look what he says in verse 35. He starts talking about farmer language here. Look what he says. He says, you've been told four months between planting and harvesting. Every farmer knows this, right? You go plant a seed and four months later, you're going to harvest something. Hopefully about four months, a crop's going to grow. So you think when you plant a seed, you got to wait a moment and then the harvest comes. That is true. But then look what Jesus says. This is so good. He says, but I say, wake up. Look, look. The harvest is ripe. They're coming. Listen, it don't have to take four months when the Word of God's seed is planted. Look, it's not even been four hours and the city is coming. The fields are ripe. The laborers are few. Let's go. Look, they're coming right towards us. And folks, listen to me. This region is ripe for a harvest. It is so ripe right now. And right now is the time for us not to shrink back. Right now is not the time for us to lay down. Every farmer knows the harvest time is one of the most hardest time. People think harvest is great. Are you kidding me? That's when you got to work your tail off because you're trying to get as much crop as you can so you can sell it and make money or feed your family. You work during the harvest time. You don't relax during harvest season. Ask any farmer. You don't. The harvest is that which means this. We've got to go. We've got to go. You've been called and sent by God to your family, to your friends, to your teammates, your classmates, your roommates, your coach at work. We can't stop. We can't arrive. We will never arrive until this region, until this world knows Jesus. So let's be a people that goes. The harvest is ripe. And then look at this, look at this. Verse 39. Many Samaritans from the village believed they believed in Jesus. Don't miss this. This is so important. Because of the woman. See, I love the Bible. It's so good. John wants us to know. The Holy Spirit wants us to know. It's because of her. The disciples, I didn't say this in the first service, just came to me. The disciples, the mighty men of God, go into the city 
and bring no one out. But the overlooked, immoral woman goes in the city and they all come out. See, you just told the person beside you, God wants to use you just the way you are. And if God can use her, God can use you. Here's the question. How many people are gonna be in the family of God because of you? Because of you. Because you stood up and you went to your school, young people. You didn't back down when you got to college. You went in the workplace and you shared Jesus and you showed Jesus by how you live. Because of you, how many people are gonna be in the family of God? God's called you and sent you to the world. And then in verse 42, look at this one. Then they said to who? The woman. <laughs> now we believe. Not just because what you've told us. Not just because you invited us. Not just because you came and preached at us and said, come and see. Because we have heard him. Faith comes from hearing and hearing the word. We have heard him for ourselves. And now we know that he is the Messiah. He is the Savior of the world. Because of you. I'm, listen, folks, what a glorious moment that would be because of you. That people would go to, come to know Jesus. The ones that the world has turned their back on. We would embrace and say, no, God wants to use you. God wants to save you. So let me ask you this question. Who right now comes to your mind that's in your circle of influence? One of your friends, family members, coworkers, it don't matter. It could be an enemy. Who in your circle of influence right now needs to encounter Jesus, needs to know Jesus? I'm gonna trust right now that the Holy Spirit brought someone to your mind. And that person they brought to your mind is your mission field for you to go after them. In fact, here's my challenge to you. And I don't want you to clap out of this. I don't want you just to bypass this. I want you to do, every one of you to do this. Would you maybe take a pen and paper out, your worship guide, take your phone and type in. Would you list the three people that you're gonna pray for every single day for the next two weeks? to get their hearts ready as you say, come and see how God's changed my life and you bring them to one of our Easter services. There's four of them. Here's the reason why. It's the greatest time ever to invite people. People will come out with you on Easter. They will come. And you can say, come and see. And listen, you're gonna bring them to the house and I'm gonna preach the gospel. And they're gonna have an opportunity to respond and get saved. And they'll say, thank you for inviting me because of you who didn't give up on me, who didn't beat me up, who loved me, brought me, and now I believe. Would you begin to pray for those people in your life? You know, right before Pentecost, there was 120 people. God commissioned them and sent them into the world. And 120 people, because of their faith in Jesus, changed the world. Imagine what God could do with us in this region. The sky's the limit. Jesus says this in Luke 14. Look what he says in the last verse and we're done. He says, go out into the country. Go out into all the lanes and the highways. Go behind the hedges. Urge anyone, everyone that you find to what? To come. To come. Why? So that my house will be full. You know, God wants to save your husband, man, more than you want to see your husband saved. You know God wants to bring your wayward kid home more than you want your wayward kid to come home? You know that God wants to save your school more than you want to save your school? You know God wants to save this region more than you and I want to see a region changed? He wants His house full. He wants His family full. And He's commissioned you and me to live a sent life, to go as He sends us. And to what Jesus says, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. And we should be on the same mission with our Savior. I'm going to ask people to bow your head. You know, a while ago, I, I said, who comes to your mind? 
Who comes to your mind? Maybe for you, the person that's come to your mind is you. You're like, Pastor, man, I can't really share Jesus. I don't, even, I don't really know him yet, you know? Maybe I'm the one that needs to get saved. And if your name came to your own mind, that's because the Holy Spirit says you need to get saved. How do I do that? Well, the Bible says if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And I'm gonna give you an opportunity right now to respond and give your life to Jesus. Because if he's told you and drawing you and your heart's about to be out of your chest, that's God saying, come on, let's go. I've purposely created you and saved you for a purpose. Would you give your life to Jesus? If that's you, I'm gonna ask you to pray with me. Now saying a prayer don't save you, you know that, but your lips can proclaim what your heart declares. And if your heart declares that Jesus is Lord, if you're listening online or you're watching online, you can do the same thing. Just say, Jesus, I need you. I believe you came for me. I believe you died for me. And I believe you got up out of the grave for me. And God, I need you to forgive me. I'm blown it. And today I repent of my sin and give my life to you. Now help me live for you all the days of my life. You see, I'm going to believe and trust that several of you prayed that with me. In the first service, we saw four people give their life to Jesus. Today, you could be in that great company. And just like the people came out from Samaria says, we believe now, you can say, I believe now. So if that's you and you prayed with me, I want to pray for you. If that's you, here's what I want you to do. You just prayed with me. I want you to raise your hand right now where you says, get your hand high. I'm going to pray for you. Get it up. Come on. Get it up. No, put it up. I can see it right now. Put it, I want to see your hand. Anybody else? Come on. You got nothing to be ashamed of. I'm going to pray for you. Now listen, I'm so proud of you guys that just raised your hand. Listen, if you would take your worship guide that you're probably sitting on and you'll fill that out at the bottom. And as you leave, you can even take it to the red room or listen, drop it off to one of our team members at the back door holding the door for you. We want to celebrate for you what God's doing in your life. And here's my last invitation for every one of you to live a sent life. That this week you can say, come and see how God's changed my life. As you get ready, we go into the Easter season. In just a couple weeks, we're going to take communion together as a family, celebrate his death, burial, and resurrection. You don't want to miss this one. It's going to be awesome on Palm Sunday. And then Easter, oh my goodness, Super Bowl Sunday, y'all. It's time to get ready. Don't back down. It's time to go after every single one we can and bring them into the house of the Lord. So I'm asking you to stand your feet as I pray over us. God, thank you for your love, your reckless love, your grace and your mercy. God, thank you for the several people that raised their hand and got saved today. I pray, God, that you put us on mission for a mission with you, Jesus, and that's to live a sent life. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for drawing us. God, thank you for using us. It's in your name we ask and pray. Come on now, and everybody say it. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today online. If you were impacted by the message today and you made a decision to start following Jesus, we want to celebrate with you. Click on the I Accepted Jesus tab on our website at betterlife.church slash salvation. If you're interested in supporting the ministry of Better Life Church, you can give online today at betterlife.church slash give now. Have a great week and we hope to see you again soon.